Hello and welcome to On The Curbs. I'm your host, Team Arbus Daily. Joining me this week is Asian Le Mans series driver, James Sweetman. We got up a little while back to chat about how he got into motorsport later in life, what it was like racing in the Gulf Radical Cup, how challenging it was to race in the aforementioned Asian Le Mans series, what reality TV show he'd create, and much more. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, hi, James. Thank you very much for being here today. First of all, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Enjoying the lovely uh, English slash British weather that we have around us now. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess, nearly spring, hopefully, but you couldn't tell really by looking out the window some days. No, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it seems to be getting four seasons in every hour at the moment. So, uh, yeah, looking forward As to you say, summer, British summer. weather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, first question I like to ask everyone that I talk to on here: What first got you interested in motorsport? Um, I mean, I, I've ever since I can remember watching Formula One on the weekends in my with my dad. Um, you know, back in the day, watching Nigel Mansell, Damon Hill. Um, that was my earliest memories of uh, motorsport. And then in later years, being around um, classic cars and working uh, as a as a it's on work experience uh, in a classic car, classic race garage with uh, Austin Healy. So it's um, been in my blood sort of since very early single digit years. That's a very nice way to to start off being interested there, I guess, with with Williams in its heyday. And then, like you say, Austin Healy is not a bad car to be around either. Yeah, I, I think there's probably a better car to watch than, than drive, so I've heard. But um, <laughs> it's still just the most amazing cars to, to watch going around the track. Um, but hopefully I'll get a chance to drive one, one day soon. That'd be very nice indeed. And I definitely won't be jealous. He says lying unconvincingly. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so then racing wise, you've only been doing this for a few years, really, but uh, you got started and you were racing in the Radical Challenge Championship back in 2021. And you want to race there in what was a pretty packed field by the look of things. So what was that whole experience like for you? Yeah, it was amazing. It was it, it all as everything that I've done in racing seems to, to follow this trend of happening quite quickly. Um, I was over in the Middle East and um, a good friend of mine um, is into racing and experienced driver. And he was entering this this radical series, the Gulf Radical Cup. Um, and it's, it just seemed like an amazing thing to do. Um, and I found myself buying a, um, a radical SR3 um, in, Unfortunately, or fortunately, or skipped the the SR1 phase, which is what people usually start in. Um, moved straight into the radical with um, slicks and aero, and uh, found myself racing. And I guess that was in September 20, um, and it was just incredible. I mean, even you know, my, my most poignant memory I've got so far of racing is just that first time I got to turn one with all the cars around me, and like the sensation of the and the smell of the smoke and the dust and the, it, I, it's still the most standout memory of my entire life so far and and um if they say that was my gateway experience it's what well and truly got me got me hooked and um on the trajectory that i am today were you fully focused in that moment or was that kind of a little bit of an out-of-body experience there and then you had to immediately get back into the zone like right i've actually got to drive this now do you know what it was an out-of-body experience i i, I just i don't really remember the race um, I remember crashes, um, but um, I really remember the the race. But I can just remember that one moment of 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 hitting of get of getting to turn one for the first time. Um, and it, yeah, it was an out of body experience, um, which very quickly brought me back into my body and around all the other radicals racing around me. But just an uh, insane experience. What was it like to win then in in that series? Because I'm guessing that you were obviously there to try and get on the podium, try and get to win, but it's one thing thinking about another thing actually achieving that then. Yeah, I mean, so again, so that was, um, so I started out in the Middle East, um, did the race series there, um, then came back to the UK where I joined the uh, the UK race series. Mm. Um, and both fiercely competitive series, but um, more more competition in the UK and um, I moved into a, a newer generation of uh, radical um, got to Silverstone um, it was in the middle of the the championship we did extra testing extra practice 
Um, and my nemesis of joining starting the UK was this precipitous thing that comes out of the air because we don't get that <laughs> in, um, in the Middle East. So my so first experience, yeah, so my, my first ever experience of A, a UK track and B, rain um, and then driving in the rain was at uh, Brands Hatch GP being let loose on the um, Brands GP loop with this stuff falling in the air. And um, it was a very, very tall learning curve. Didn't necessarily go as it should in every um, every corner, but um, learned so much from that. By the time we got a few more rounds later to Silverstone, and obviously it's got quite um, a, an abrasive surface there, um, it all kind of came together. We did make some good choices with the tyres, whereas a lot of uh, the field went out uh, on wet, whereas we elected to go out on slicks, and we managed to get them into the window quickly. And... Um, other than you know, the first five laps was pretty precarious, keeping on the road and getting tire a temperature into the tires. Um, and then yes, we brought it home with a, I believe it was a sixteen second win. Um, and again, I mean, I know I've just said that my my first turn one in Dubai was one of the best experiences of my life. But yeah, coming across the line um, first was, yeah, I think they said they could see me waving my hands and screaming as I went across the line. My friend's wife was watching so um that was just insane i mean that that really i, I just could not believe it um that's, in 16 that's, seconds as well that's not exactly a close thing in the end that's that's doing a pretty good job of of winning there yeah it was i mean i mean yeah look credit to everyone that was there Rad the, with my team i was with the radical works team did an amazing job to give us the car set up um and amazing coaching from uh tom gladys and um help from the guys around but um yeah it was just phenomenal and again just keep on further getting me more and more into this amazing amazing sport through in the deep end but you're able to swim luckily yes <laughs> yeah luckily you then had to wait for the next school for Edible cup for your next podium so how challenging was the interim for you and how much of a relief was it for you when you did get back onto the podium um yeah it was a it was a big um you know we went through the first round um it ended up being some intrinsic issues with the car, which for the first round, it literally felt like, you know, we it, it felt like our first ever race again. Mm. And so the guys from Radical came out and did um, examination and actually found out we had a chassis issue. Um, the chassis was actually bent. There was about nine millimetres difference yeah. from front to back. That'll so, do. yeah, that really um, was very, I was very happy to find that information out because yeah, we sorted that out, um, got back into a good bit of equipment. And yeah, it was a huge relief to get back on the podium, consistently on the podium. Um, hmm. We actually had a few uh, technical issues, which robbed us of some of the ones we should have had. Um, and yeah, it was a, a huge relief. Is it a bit more um, reassuring, I guess is the word, that it was a mechanical thing or a technical thing later on instead of something that you had done and that you were able to then pinpoint and be like, okay, we can fix that. And then it's, it's not about me making a mistake then and i can just get on with the job when it's all sorted yeah ab absolutely because you obviously go through a huge sort of it's a big psychological blow when you go from sort of being at the being a front runner um to then struggling to be at the back of the midfield and um, mm. you know you all ask all sorts of questions of yourself um and you know ultimately you have to as as i've learned in the relatively short time I've been in it you've got to trust you know everything that you've learned and trust your experience um and yeah just dig deep and keep on going and yeah big 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 relief to find out that it was those issues going off what you're saying then with all of that you know, kind of tough period in, in racing did you impress yourself more than you thought here with the competitiveness of the series being higher than normal with twice the number of cars competing as well that year um Yes, I, I think I think that would be the right thing. I, we, it was a, it was a tough that winter series. Um, they say we had the car issue. Um, I then had um, a very very mild case of COVID, but subsequently had long COVID, and yeah. the the actual case of COVID itself didn't really affect me. Um, it was a couple of days, but I then subsequently, and this is what I, I understood after the time, was I had long COVID. So I was struggling with um, the effects of that, particularly the fatigue. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, we went from, you know, getting back on the podium, getting lots of good results. We then got another another car, which was based on with a new a new chassis again. And we just we just struggled with that. So um, 
I believe um, we did finish the season with a podium, um, a second place in Yas Marina, which was great. But yeah, it was a very, very up and down season. I'd say in some ways, there were you more impressed with yourself then because of all of that and being able to to still get up there on the podium, I guess, despite all of the trouble that you were having. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I think my coach and the team just thought that I love to have naps all the time and I was even actually <laughs> old I was. But now, as I say, back when I saw some of the back to Asian on this year, I was like, look, guys, I've gone days without having a nap, just my sleep at night. So, yeah, it would have I, it would have been interesting to see what we could have done if we didn't have uh, the long COVID situation. But yeah, great fun though. It's more a sport sometimes, unfortunately. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. You then competed in the Asian One Series early this year alongside Vladislav Lonko for CD Sport with a best finish of P5, very short championship and very kind of short in two senses. And that's it's only four rounds, but they're all back to back rounds, more or less. So, how did this championship differ from your perspective from previous ones? Um, so it was the first, my first experience of, of racing um, the the Ligier LMP3. Um, the first difference and the second difference being, of course, um, that we were endurance racing and I was a, a one of one of the team of three drivers um, and a whole different kettle of fish. Um, first, obviously, adapting to the, the Ligier. Um, it's a car that is obviously much, much faster, but you have to adapt driving style. Um, I had to change from being a right foot breaker to a left foot breaker. Um, to be to, to actually have the physical power and to keep my How spine easy intact. To get up. used to. Well, I, it's one of those things. So I did a lot of practice in the simulator, um, <laughs> and then I went and did a single race in the radical just before Asian Le Mans to to commit to it. And I think once I once I started to commit to it over the process of, of a month, um, there's no going back. Um, but it did. It takes a lot of coordination, mm. and I think even. Now, after when I come into the pits in the Ligier, um, so then think right, left foot no longer break, left foot must press clutch. Yes, it's, it takes some dexterity that um, is easier said than done. But now I would never go back to it. Um, you know, you, um, just the way that the angles work of physically hitting the brake, you're not putting that sideways pressure on your spine. So, but um. But yeah, no, it was, it was again amazing experience. It's brilliant being part of um, a team. Um, Vlad was an amazing guy to drive alongside, um, as was Fabian in um, the first round. Um, yes, of course. We didn't have all our have the luck on our side. Um, we had some setup problems, and there was a lot of red flags and stuff. So for us to suddenly come together after never meeting, although I tell you about Vlad and I had um, worked in the sim, but the three of us to come together after never meeting and then operate as a team, setting the car up. Um, that itself did have its have its issues. Um, round one, again, we just, we had a few issues. Um, round two, stuff started to go our way. Um, had a P5, but we had a, um, established quite um, a good benchmark to then move forward upon. Mm. Uh, we then had a teammate change. Um, um, Jack Wolf then joined us. Um, and again, he then had to go through what we went through in round one and two in that he just arrived at the team. We had, you know, established probably how we wanted to run the car and how we were going to work. And I think it was quite, um, it was quite a tall order for him to jump in. Um, and he hadn't ever driven over in the Middle East either. So very experienced MP3 driver, but new experience driving in the Middle East. So yeah, they, they didn't go our way rounds three and four. Um, I think and it follows three, that pattern was, of what I was saying before of just getting chucked in the deep end continuously. Yeah, he was really chucked in at the deep end. Um, so yeah, round three, I believe. I think we had so we had a gearbox failure during the practice, so we lost half of the testing time. Then yeah, round three, um, there was a crash on the second lap, which took us out. Um, and round four, um, it issues with the other driver and then Vlad had some other problems as well with penalties and stuff. So yeah, unfortunately it was a bit of a one to forget, but um, I still had a great time. I had an amazing stint and ultimately it was the, the, the that stint that's helped me to get the drive that I have now, basically. <laughs> you say like at the very least it's all good experience and because it, a lot of the time it's not going to be smooth sailing for one reason or another, be it something with the car, be it something with the driver or just, the race itself, like you say, if there's a red flag and you can't do anything about that, it still can 
bugger up the whole strategy and you just you have to deal with that so like you yeah. say at least you can get the, the experience out of it and I suppose a big part of that is as well that being in LMP3 you're not the only category out on track there so was that a bit odd getting used to having the LMP2s and GT cars as well as well there and then trying to differentiate when you're supposed to be racing when you're supposed to be conserving a little bit and when you should maybe be trying to be doing both or what was what was going through your mind for that it was it was very much um I mean I think um particularly with round one in Dubai there was a um there was a big crash on the I think on the warm-up lap of race one and so there was a delay of about three hours I think and so my stint ended up being three uh, well I think it was a one hour 40 stint and an hour of it was in the dark so I've never driven in the dark before never raced p3 before in multi-class series um so the LMP2s once you can identify what their lights look like and you understand that they're going to whiz around you on the corner not so much the straight i mean they are faster on the straights but not much faster on the straights but yeah the gts were yeah interesting um <laughs> yeah, whether there's quite a, a variety of driving standards if i can put it like that you've obviously got factory pros which are insane and then you've obviously got some other 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 people taking part um who aren't insane um or as the case might be um and yeah but of course like you know a, a well-driven gt especially when if you're on a um, compared to an lmp3 where tires are starting to go off with you know and, and a normal driver in with the with the electronic age that the gt has got you know there's not a huge difference in in um in lap time um hmm. it's only when an lmp3 has got a good driver in or a good set of boots or in quality when they're mega mega fast um but yeah they were i think the gts were the hard thing to you obviously get the clusters of gts battling together and then you have to try and find a way a way around them a way through them so to speak usually in under braking zones or on high speed corners which is like just where you don't want to be doing it bit of a strategy for you <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it must I say the great thing about Donation Mom was was now learning all that because mm. in radicals we have done multi class racing against the usually usually lower class lower category SR ones. Um, but yeah, it was a new experience to me have having fast cars racing racing a faster series racing against us. Would you say that was the most challenging aspect of this championship then, especially as all three fields were fairly tight for for the most part? Um. Yeah, I think it, it. Yes, I mean it, it's de it's definitely a skill in itself, sort of planning where you want to overtake them, and you're planning your strategy and getting past them. Um, I think whether it's the the biggest skill. I mean, for me, um, the length of the stint sometimes, uh, combined with the heat and the concentration and banging in, you know, thirty five laps, all trying to get them within a, a second of each other. Um, I think that probably has to go up there as, as the, the toughest element of it. Um, but time really does fly when you're out there, but still it just takes the tiniest thing with all the, you know, the fuel loads going down and the tires going off, but then the tires are still better with low fuel than they are with good mm. tires and high fuel. And you think, oh, all of a sudden the car is just constantly alive and changing its characteristics. Um, but perhaps, you know, when I get, when I get back in it again, um, that won't be so hard to deal with, but yeah just generally all amazing building up that repertoire with the car like you say yeah yeah yeah, yeah. As, as you say literally you, you get to the point with it where you're you're not really thinking about it as much anymore it's you're just kind of, of an extension of you yeah yeah you, as long as you know like look at your braking point and you think well, well i've got good tires now i can break just after that the tires are knackered now i need to break just before that hmm. um and yeah i guess situation awareness and not trying to have situational capture where you lose your awareness of what's going on around you. But um, yeah, I think it's the, uh, driving in the dark into by around turn three and four, it's not lit out the back and you just have to turn into the apex of turn four without being, without you seeing it's it. There. <laughs> think it's there. <laughs> so you think, oh, am I on, you know, on the runoff area going towards the wall at 130 miles an hour or is there an apex there? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not envious of that part of it. I'll definitely, I'll definitely <laughs> say that. Going, just driving around going, oh my god i wish i played golf right now <laughs> no i was changing for anything no i didn't think so really um looking ahead to the rest of 2023 then what are your racing plans um so i'm um just recently confirmed i'm driving for graph racing in road to le mans um so series starts um 
first round Barcelona next month. That's going to be um, my focus um, for this year. Um, other plans, um, looking ahead, I, I'll have to see what happens with the Asian Le Mans calendar um, and what um, what pro what what might be available or what might not. Um, looking um, might do another might do a guest appearance in the Radical series um, in the in our summer break. We've got about there's about a seven week break between. Um, midway through the season in road to Le Mans. So perhaps that, but uh, yeah, no, the full focus is um, on LMP3 road to Le Mans um, with the simulated training fitness. I'll, I'll do some karting. I'll be in, in the IAMI as much as I can um, mm. to keep my, keep my neck working. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's my main focus. It should be good fun though. I mean, uh, road, road to Le Mans always, always got some good racing going on there and all kinds of, fun action i think for the last few years it's just been getting better every year i think in terms of quality of race craft there so yeah i mean my first time i saw i went to go and watch um my friend mohammed right race in the porsche support series at Le Mans last year and um, when i watched the the road to Le Mans start to see all these lmp3s going into the um the penultimate corner i just thought it was the most insane thing i've ever seen in my life i couldn't i just 30 lmp3s I'm assuming I made it through. <laughs> I know. I'm just thinking, oh my god! And now I'm going to be doing it. So um, it'll be one of these things. I probably won't believe I'm doing it until I've done it. And, and even then, then you yeah. have to do the watch back party later on, just to make sure that you definitely were the one in the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Not on the side of the track. Hopefully, watching everyone. <laughs> Damn, I knew I was supposed to be somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A couple of fun non motorsport related questions to finish off with then. If you were forced into gladiatorial combat, but could only choose a weapon that isn't typically considered to be a weapon, what would you choose? <laughs> um, uh, um, <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> you say it's a gladiatorial combat. Yeah, but any traditional weapons out of the door. So you think maybe household items, I guess. I say this to you like uh, I've given it a lot of thought myself, and I haven't, and I'm now realising this. I'm now looking around the house to think what I could use. Um, and not not um, a um, a laser measuring device. Okay, because I could use laser. Just blind them. That's what's on my. Table. <laughs> yeah, I've got a laser. I've got a laser measuring device on my table for measuring the insides of commercial properties. So I would bring that. And, just distract and try and blind. Yeah. Fair enough, that works. Blind them, yeah. Try and blind them at once and distract them and run away. <laughs> and then, final question If you could create any reality TV show, what would you make? Well, it's obviously going to have to be motor racing related. So, um, I, I think, as you said, that there's no cost cap in what you said. It's going to involve a Formula One car um, <laughs> and. Uh, Cast of cast of non Love Island esque people and their challenges to um, to learn how to try and drive that car as fast as possible and it's going to be a modern the current series of Formula One cars that could be quite entertaining I won't lie yeah <laughs> maybe it should be some Love, some Love Island esque people but that could be taken the wrong way so non Love Island esque people yeah, that annoy a few people more than it would uh, please them I think in a lot of sense. Yes. Still yes. be amusing, but no. uh, for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. No, ten ran ten people randomly selected who've never driven a race car before who have to learn how to drive a Formula One car. Netflix, if you're listening, there you go. We do your job <laughs> for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you today. I want to thank you very much for your time and wish you the best of luck for everything in twenty twenty three. Thanks so much, Tina. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, great talking to you all soon. Thanks again to James for coming onto the curbs with me. I can't wait to see how he gets on in the 2023 racing season. If you want to follow James's career, links to his socials will be in the description below, so do go and check those out. Join me again next time when I'll be chatting to another famous face from the world of motorsport. In the meantime, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, as well as check out the back catalogue of episodes on the On The Curbs channel. If you want even more from me, you can listen to me chat about everything Formula 1 over on the Undercut podcast, as well as delving into the world of Nitro Rallycross over on the Nitro RX podcast. 
both available wherever you get your podcasts. As for written content, I currently write for Is It Fast, Paddock Priority, and Paddock Passion, so be sure to check all of them out with original pieces released each week. All of the information and links for those will be in the description below, as well as my Instagram and TikTok handles if you want to go and follow me there. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll be back soon with another episode.